Uh, I wanted to give you an example about uh, obstructive issues. And this was a, an elderly gentleman that came in from a long-term care facility. And um, my student was taking care of him. And he came in to, uh, for urinary sepsis. And they were treating him with the standard issues. They gave him plenty of IV fluids, which helps flush out the system. Luckily, he didn't have any cardiac or other problems that uh, prohibited him from having adequate fluids. They gave him antibiotics. And they cleared up his UTI. And in the chart, it was noted that probably the reason for his urinary sepsis was an enlarged prostate gland. And of course, that day, they were going to discharge him and send him back to the long-term care facility. And so I had to uh, tell my students, you know, are, are we doing the right thing here? And she's like, what are you talking about? You know, he's got his antibiotics, he's going, his UTI's cleared up, they've checked that and everything. And I said, but what caused his UTI? What sent him into urinary sepsis? Oh. And guess what? When the patient came in, he actually did have an elevation in his BUN and creatinine. So what does that tell you? It tells you that he was in the early phases of acute renal failure, yes? So, you know, what is our obligation for treatment for this patient? You could start out by saying, well, you know, he, he's an elderly patient. He lives in a long-term care facility. So, you know, we just ding him up and send him back. Uh, guess what? He's going to be back again with the same problem, right? Why is he going to be back again with the same problem? Because he has an enlarged prostate. Sometimes we as nurses need to speak up and be an advocate for the patient and point out that, you know, we know that he's cleared up and everything is good, but the cause of the problem has not been taken away. And so the chances are he's going to show up again with the same problem. And the next time his kidneys might fail to a point where they won't recover. Okay, so I'm um, just pointing that out. And I, I was frustrated, and, and, and our viewpoint did not get heard nor paid attention to. I still had to say something. I, I, was, I just had to. It's like, excuse me, but the cause is prostate enlargement. We haven't taken care of that. He's still going to have that. He's still going to retain urine. He's still at risk for acute renal failure. So we're sending him off, and the next time he comes back, he might need be facing dialysis. Okay, so just something to think about. It seems real like not a big deal. You know, you pick your patient for clinical. It's a urinary sepsis patient. Came from a nursing home. They don't drink much. Maybe he's wearing a diaper. I don't know. I don't know. Frustrates me. It's just something to think about. All right, acute renal failure pephases, and when I wrote these notes was I think right after I bought a price pephister pephosid or something like that, so that's the way it came out on the slides. But the kidney goes through certain phases in acute renal pephalure. And how does it start? There's some sort of an insult, something that's happened before, in, or after the kidney. How do we know? They stop making urine. That is the cardinal thing that occurs. They don't pee enough. How much urine do we have to have? 30 cc's per hour. Normal urine output, fix your slides, 750 to 2,000. 30 cc's per hour. That's how much pee we have to have. If we don't have it, we got to do something. We can't just tell the next nurse, sorry, there's no pee. You better watch that. Sorry, there's no pee. You better watch that. Uh, we're obligated to do something about it. So oliguria, that is the phase where the patient by definition has less than 400 cc's of urine in 24 hours. That's the definition of oliguria by the book. Okay? Less than 30 cc's an hour times two hours. That's my standard of care for ICU. If I don't get 30 cc's an hour times two hours, you know, if I'm watching hourlies, I got a call. We get an elevation of BUN and creatinine together. What does it tell us if they go up together? We have kidney failure. We have an issue. We have to do something. Okay? We will see elevation in the other types of things that the kidney gets rid of. Organic acids. What's that? Hydrochloric, sulfuric, phosphoric, etc. Magnesium. This is the killer. Put a star by it. In acute renal failure, the potassium goes up. That's the killer. And you know what? In our chronic renal failure patients, our end-stage renal failure patients, to some degree, they're adaptive. They're used to living with an elevated potassium, but in a patient with acute renal failure, they're not. All of a sudden, their potassium's really high, and it's very dangerous for them. Now, this is the part I don't like, 
Being an ICU nurse, I'm not really going to know, generally speaking, whether this patient comes out of acute renal failure or not because this phase can last 7 to 21 days. That is one to three weeks. So the patient may not know whether or not their kidneys are going to recover. So that's the oliguric phase. The next thing that we hope happens, we hope, we pray, is that they enter the diuretic phase. And all of a sudden, you just don't believe it. It's like overnight, there's all this pee coming out. It's, it's like liquid gold. We're so excited. If it's gold at all, sometimes there's just so much coming out that it's just like water. You know, the Foley bag is just bulging. We're like, oh my gosh, this is exciting. Your kidneys are working. But we have other issues that can happen. They pee so much that we're worried about them going into dehydration. And they pee so much that we're worried about their potassium levels actually dropping. But during this phase, we should see a normalization of the BU and a creatinine, and it should come down. There are a few patients, and this is why we have to be cautiously optimistic. There are some patients who only pee water as the kidney function returns, and they do not get rid of waste products. Okay, and they call that a non oliguric renal failure. They pee water but not waste products. So there are a few patients that even though they go into the diuretic phase, they still have to have dialysis. So be careful, you know, be careful in your optimism with them. It's exciting that they're peeing water, but we also have to make sure that they're getting rid of their uh, waste products as, ne as necessary. This phase can last 7 to 14 days, so you got to make sure they're getting enough fluid and that they don't dehydrate. The recovery phase can last for up to a year, and all I'm going to tell you about that is their kidneys are never as strong as they were. They will always have weak kidneys after that. Once you have an insult, once you have acute renal failure, they're never as good as they were. All right, so with acute renal failure, you can make the difference. We can make the huge difference for these patients. We have to treat an elevated potassium. We'll talk more about how to do that in the next class. We're going to watch for that elevated BU and creatinine. How do we know it's renal failure? They go up together. together. That's what it is, all right? Managing fluid volume overload, especially in the acute patient. They stop making urine. They're going to retain fluids. What am I worried about? I'm worried about their lungs. Assess them early. Watch them through the day. Make sure that they're not going to fluid volume overload. Can I give them Lasix to get rid of the fluid? Only if they can pee. Because you think, well, I need, I need to give them a diuretic. Sometimes the doctors will give them diuretics. Give them 120 of Lasix, IV push, does nothing. Give them 120 of Lasix again, IV push, it does nothing. See, and after that, I don't want to play anymore. Give them another 120, you give them another 120. It's not doing nothing. That's what I'm thinking. If I'm a smart nurse, I don't verbalize that. They're going to track me down. But you get the point. If they're making urine, you might be able to diurese them that way, but otherwise you're looking at they're going to need dialysis or something. So identifying the cause and watching for complications. And I just want to share with you that you really can make a difference with this too. I had a patient in ICU when I was working in California, and this particular patient went into acute renal failure. BU and creatinine went up, and we had no idea why. The patient didn't have a hypotensive event. They weren't in heart failure. They weren't in sepsis. There was no reason why. They weren't on an antibiotic that could cause the issue. I went through the list. I couldn't figure out anything. But guess what? Over the last like two days, the patient had been increasingly anxious, very anxious and fidgety. And so the nurses is Ativan. Ativan, Ativan, giving more Ativan because the patient is very fidgety and anxious. Like, I don't get this. This makes absolutely no sense to me at all. So I thought to myself, you know what? Something hasn't been checked here. Guess what I decided to do? I decided to check the Foley catheter. So after two days, I irrigated, two days, I irrigated the Foley catheter and guess what? It was plugged, and all this pee started coming out. Now, why the patient didn't leak around the Foley catheter? Why the patient didn't rupture their bladder? 
I do not know. But over that two day period, the obstruction caused by that Foley catheter caused the patient to go into acute renal failure. We got it opened up. The patient started peeing and all of a sudden they didn't need Ativan anymore. Ativan, Ativan, because they weren't trying to fidget and crawl out of the bed. What does it feel like when you got to pee really bad? <laughs> well, that's what the patient was experiencing night and day. Ativan treats that very nicely, but does it take away the cause? So then I was like the joke in the unit. Anybody went into renal failure, just, just send Hefter in there and let, him, let her irrigate the Foley. That she has the cure all for acute renal failure. <laughs> Okay, that was my billing for quite some time after that. But the point is, you know, we may, you know, you go through this transition in nursing school. You're in block one and you're emptying the Foley, you're recording the INO. You know, as you get through two, three, and four, you're like thinking about the Foley. You're thinking about what caused that acute renal failure. Can you figure it out? Somebody has to figure it out. You're with them all day there, all day long to start looking at all these issues and reasons. Now what would have happened if I didn't irrigate the Foley? The bladder might have ruptured or the patient might have gone into renal failure and not recovered. We can make a difference every single day, even if it's a bad day. Just, I want to put that so much into your brain. I don't have any of you clinically this semester. Understand that every single day you can make a difference even if you just don't even want to be there. Uh, give your patients what you've got. You can make a difference for them. All right, now, somewhere in between acute renal failure and end-stage renal disease, there is a lot of gray, right? And I want you to be aware of that, and I want to give you some terms and tell you how the doctor uses those terms on the chart so that you have some idea. Normal patient, maybe they're diabetic, will develop some degree of chronic renal insufficiency, CRI. This patient has some degree of loss of renal function, but they don't need dialysis. The most nebulous term of all is CRF, chronic renal failure. When you see that, you don't know, is the patient on dialysis at end stage? Are they at chronic renal insufficiency or what? So when you see CRF on the chart, you have to do more investigation. Do they mean they need dialysis to live? Or do they mean their kidneys are pretty bad? Do they still pee? CRF is very nebulous. It's not like, what does that mean? You gotta figure that out. If it's ESRD, in stage renal disease, they got to have dialysis to live. But some doctors call that same patient CRF, chronic renal failure. So those are some of the terms. Now, if we don't have a patient in acute renal failure that gets better, shall I say, an acute renal failure patient that does not resolve. They will become chronic renal failure in stage renal disease and they will need dialysis to live. So let's talk about chronic renal failure. You do not want this. You really don't want this. This is not a good situation. It's not reversible. Causes, diabetes and hypertension are number one for us. I would say diabetes is the number one cause. What happens? All the jobs the kidney is supposed to perform for us fail. Everything isn't happening. So retention of nitrogenous waste. What goes up together? BUN and creatinine. Fluid and electrolyte balances. The patient will retain fluid, right? Which electrolyte goes up and could kill them? Potassium. Potassium. That's the one that we worry about the most. We talked about fluid retention. Vomiting and diarrhea occurs because of uh, the vomiting and diarrhea. Are, there's two different issues. One is um, the kidney clears gastrin. And gastrin is the hormone that causes the release of hydrochloric acid. We talked about that in GI. So if the kidney fails, gastrin will not be cleared. The other part that contributes is the retention of nitrogenous wastes. The elevated BUN and creatinine cause upset in the stomach, problems in the stomach. Why is this patient anemic? No EPO, no EPO. They're not making erythropoietin. Why do they have calcium and phosphorus imbalances? The kidney is unable to activate vitamin D. And if we don't have activated vitamin D, we will not absorb calcium, all right? Why do they have metabolic acidosis? <coughs> They cannot excrete the non-volatile acids, hydrochloric, 
sulfuric, phosphoric, those guys, and the kidney cannot produce bicarbonate. Those are huge issues. Let's just see if we can eat ourselves alive. I mean, we generally speaking are an acid factory as it is. Acid is the byproduct of most of the, the things that happen in our body anyway. All right, so I have to make it simple for myself. I put it in red. If the kidneys don't work, your waste products build up, your fluids are retained, you don't make blood, and you don't absorb calcium. That's the plain talk that is in my brain. Assessment, no pee. No pee. In stage renal disease patients, most of them don't make any urine. Bion and creatinine go up together, potassium goes up. You know, really the lab profile for these patients, most everything goes up. There's only a few things that go down. What goes down? Calcium, Calcium and H and H, red blood cells. And it doesn't matter if it's acute or chronic renal failure, you get the same profile. That helps in learning renal. All right, so the patient develops hypertension. Why? Fluid retention. They can go into CHF. Why? Fluid retention. They can get pulmonary edema. Why? Fluid retention. So what's a big issue for these patients? Fluid retention. How do we get rid of it? Dialysis. That's usually what we're looking at. All right, so another thing that we might do for them is restrict fluids. They hate it. Might be a thousand to fifteen hundred cc's per day. They hate it. All they're gonna get is one forty-four ouncer for the day. They will take their urinals and go to the bathroom and fill them up with water. Gunk, 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 gunk. I'd like to tell you I've never seen that. I would like to tell you I've never seen that. I have seen that. Now let me ask you a question. If we're going to manage the patient's fluid volume status, which would be the best indicator? INO or weight? That's right, because you might not catch your patient in the bathroom sucking out of the faucet or drinking out of their urinal. You might not catch them doing that. The weight does not lie, right? If they're drinking a lot of extra fluid, you're going to pick it up that way. Do I think I've ever done a perfect INO in my entire 20 plus years of being a nurse? How many of you know it's not possible? It's not. <laughs> we have an approximation. We have an idea of what's going on. It's not perfect ever. And we can't say how much they're losing insensibly. We don't know how much they're losing in their stool, how much they're sweating out if they have a temp. There's things we can't know. We just can't know. All right, other things we might see treatment-wise, treatment -wise, uh, cation exchange resin, that's referring to the medication K-exalate. K-exalate treats a high potassium. It's nice that it starts with a K. It treats a high potassium level, right? It's an exchange resin, which means it gives the patient salt or sodium and it binds to itself potassium. An important thing with K-exalate, in order for it to work, it has to come back out. It has to come back out, right? If it stays in the system, the, the potassium gets reabsorbed. So diarrhea is necessary. Sorry to tell you that. Okay, calcium replacement, yes, but we also have to give that with activated vitamin D. Phosphate binders, we'll talk about that more in the next class. They don't excrete it, so we have to bind it. Bicarbonate, that's about the only time we give bicarbonate these days. We used to give it so much, is in a patient who has renal failure. They don't make bicarbonate. If they come in acidotic, they're going to usually get a couple amps of bicarb. Now, epigen or blood, how do we know? Yes. Symptomatology. If the patient has a really low hemoglobin and they're having symptoms, we're going to have to give blood. Now, this patient can live at eight. This is the exception, perhaps, to the eight rule. Sometimes these doctors will let their patients sit on eight for quite a while. Again, you need to know, is the patient symptomatic with that? That is still your ammunition. If they're symptomatic with that, you're going to be able to get what you need. If they're going to need a blood transfusion, when should they receive it? 
during dialysis is the best time for them to receive it. We'll talk more about that. Special dietary restrictions, we'll talk about that later too, but generally low potassium, low protein, high carbs. Dialysis can be hemodialysis or peritoneal or transplant. All right, hemodialysis, patient has to have an access site. Either a fistula has been created or they need a central venous catheter. In this instance, that artificial kidney replaces and does for the patient what their kidney should do in most respects, meaning it removes fluid, it removes waste product, and it gives bicarbonate, or it gives acetate, which is the buffer that's used. The blood travels through these small little tubes, and the tubes are bathed with a dialysate, a solution. And in that solution, there's usually very little potassium, right? There's no waste products, and there's usually some sort of a, a particle that helps pull fluid out. Does that make sense? And there's acetate, which can go in. By principles of diffusion, things that are in high concentration move out to areas of low concentration. By principles of osmosis, there's movement of water from an area of low particles to high particles. The other thing that we do with this process is we apply force. We apply a pulling force around these tubules. That's called filtration pressure. So we pull against it and that helps facilitate movement of water and waste products and such. At any given time, the patient's gonna have about a unit of blood out of them circulating through that machine. So we have to be sure that there's adequate blood pressure before we send them there. We need to make sure what the patient's weight is. Nephrologists will establish a dry weight for most patients. I want you to be 50 kilograms when you come off the machine. So if they weigh them and they're 55 kilograms and their dry weight's considered 50, how much fluid's gonna be taken off that patient during the run? Probably five kilos. And the runs are about three hours long. How much weight is five kilos? 10 pounds. Can you imagine losing 10 pounds in three hours? I, I, like, yeah, that is, you don't want to do it this way. But generally speaking, they go through that three times a week. It's not fun. Can you imagine they're tired all the time? Okay. The fistula or the catheter that this patient gets through uh, dialysis through is their lifeline. We don't use them for anything else. We protect them very, very much so. A patient that's in stage can only go about one week without dialysis, and then they die. It happens that quickly. So if they don't come to dialysis treatment, it's a big deal. So if they don't come, we gotta let them know, you know what, if you miss another one or two, you, you can die, okay? So it's a big deal. No, they can be lots of places. They can be on their lower arms, upper arms, upper thighs. They don't usually do them below. And if it's a patient with end stage, they just keep moving them around until one day they don't have any vessels left. The catheters are not usually meant for long term. An option is peritoneal dialysis. In peritoneal dialysis, we referred to this in GI, where I was telling you that the peritoneal lining could be a uh, source of removing waste products and fluid. They put a catheter into the peritoneal cavity. We inflow a dialysate to the cavity and that causes transfer of waste products and fluids to this area. We put it in there, we let it set there for six hours, generally speaking. We drain it out. What comes out with it is waste products, okay? Electrolytes, bad things. And it's weird because when you flow it in, it's clear. When you drain it out, it looks like pee. It's like yellowish, like pee. So that's peritoneal dialysis. That one takes six hours? You know what? I'm just giving you an example of one type where many patients do six hour exchanges. Every six hour, and we call it an exchange, where they inflow fluid, they let it sit there, and then they outflow it like every six hours. It takes about 30 minutes to do that exchange. Is that the one that you Yes, yes, you can do this at home. If I gotta have it, one of these two, I want this one. This is the one I want. I know I can do this one. But not everybody can do it. Not everybody can do it. You gotta have good eyesight. 
you got to have meticulous sterile technique. You got to be able to have dexterity with your fingers. So let me see. Do you think a diabetic's a good candidate? No. Maybe, maybe not. That, and the other thing is, guess what the dialysate solution is? Sugar. Sugar. Will some of that sugar get absorbed into the system? Yes. All right, so that's one form. The best option for chronic renal failure is going to be transplantation. That's the best option. You want to get a kidney transplant if you can. That's not always easy. Trying to get a match. You know, what are you going through? How is your body deteriorating while you're waiting? Um, it's very interesting if you've seen the programs on TV. Live donor kidney transplants, they can take one out of me. They can give it to you. And right as soon as you get it, you start to make urine. Fantastic. Right out of me, right into you, you start making pee right away. Is that awesome? So live donor is best with a good match. A family member, somebody that you're related to, it's like a miracle instantly. But that's not what happens with most people who get kidney transplants, is it? Now, with the donors, a lot of times they take those anti-rejection drugs. All of them have to take anti-rejection drugs. Does that affect the new kidney they put in because yes, it can. It can. We'll get to that in just a minute. It definitely can. Now, most people that get a kidney transplant get one from a donor, and that donor might be far away. All right? And we see this with brain death patients. We'll talk about that when I do neuro with you a little bit. Maybe somebody's been in a car accident, there's no brain activity, but we've kept them alive on life support. We ask the family, do they want to donate? Not right away after they find out somebody's brain dead, but anyway. And my husband's participated in those harvest types of surgeries where they come in alive, they take everything out, and then they close them up and they're gone. I, I think that'd be hard. He said it is pretty hard, you know. But those organs can help somebody else. So during that process, they take the organ out, they put it on ice, and they transport it to someone to give it to them. Or if it's in the same facility, they have in the surgical suite next door, the patient who's going to be the recipient already open, ready to get it. But think about taking one out, putting it on ice, and transporting it. Okay? When you get a kidney that's received that way, and it's implanted into you, we're not going to really know right away whether that kidney's going to work or not. Why? It's been without oxygen. It's been without oxygen and blood flow. What has happened to that kidney? It has experienced acute renal failure. See, you get it. That's exactly right. So how long will it be before we know if that kidney is going to really work well for that patient? 7 to 21 days. That patient so will probably still be getting dialysis for that first 7 to 21 days, giving that kidney a chance to resolve acute renal failure. Very good. Very good, that's exactly what happens. If it's live to live, they work right away. There's no, inter no significant interruption in blood flow, no significant changes in metabolism for that kidney, etc. No buildup of waste products in the organ. If it's a donor and there's time and ice and those types of things, that kidney will experience some acute renal failure. And we won't necessarily know about the function of that for a while. Now, the point that Sarah brought up about anti-rejection drugs, Yes, whether it's live donor or whether it's cadaver donor, the patients that receive those will be on medications for the rest of their lives. We used to be able to pick them out. They'd be on so much prednisone, corticosteroids, that they would be Cushingoid. We're going to talk about that next week. We'd be able to tell just by looking at them. These days, they've done a good job of being able to put the patient on just enough medication to stop rejection but not cause them to have a lot of side effects. So they're doing much better. They're usually on two or three different agents. Prednisone is one. Usually they're on Imuran, some of those types of uh, drugs which suppress the immune system. So let me see. If we're suppressing the immune system, what does that place the patient at risk for? Infection. Infection. And sometimes it's really difficult to know whether the kidney is rejecting or infected. But let me guess, or let me see if you can guess, the one thing that happens if the kidney is rejecting and failing. What does the patient do if they're rejecting and failing? They don't make pee. Yes, 
Very good. You're learning something. That is the thing that we look for when a patient comes in that has a transplant and we want to know if they're infected or they're rejecting. Are they making urine? That's the most important thing of all. This is a very interesting thing. If you can get uh, a donor kidney, fantastic. I mean, that's the best possible scenario. But if not, you know, hopefully, I don't know. It's a very difficult situation. Not something that you want to deal with if you don't have to. Any questions? If your body rejects one kidney, do you get put back on the list or do you, is it more likely that you're going to reject the next kidney? Is it, okay, if you reject one kidney, can you be put back on the list? Mm -hmm. And would you be more at risk of rejecting again? Yes and yes. Uh, if you've rejected, you can get another transplant. But remember that your immune system now has formed antibodies against the one that you got. And it will be more sensitive to if you get another one. But yes, there are patients who've had more than one transplant. And you can go back on the list. In most states, the list has to do with how bad you are as to whether or not you get one and not a lot of the circumstances. We talked about liver and in some states like with liver, you have to be off alcohol if that's the reason for your failure. You have to be off alcohol six months. I don't know of restrictions related to the kidney in that respect. Okay, so if you reject, you can be back onto the list and if you're about to die, that puts you higher on the list. That sort of thing. Do you have a question? Is the cadaver one the one you're talking about if like, someone's brain dead and then they're Yes, dead? the cadaver one has to do with uh, the patient who's brain dead that we take to the surgical suite and harvest organs. Or maybe it's somebody that was in a motor vehicle accident and they were uh, DOA, dead on arrival but there's still a chance that we can harvest the organs. Those are the kidneys that will experience some degree of acute renal failure and it'll be difficult for us to know uh, how well that's going to take. But there's a lot of success. If you ever get involved in uh, Donor Network of Arizona and go to their courses, they have people come and speak to you that have received transplants. It blows your mind. There's just another person in the class sitting there. You know, we as healthcare providers tend to think about transplant medicine as the people we see that come in that are rejecting, that are having problems. But most of them don't have that. So it was like we're in class and everything and this guy comes up and he's like, I got a heart transplant. We're like, he just looked like a completely normal guy. We just thought he was late to class, you know. And he's like, I got a heart transplant 10 years ago. And I'm here to tell you, healthcare providers, that you need to give us that chance and you need to help you know, increase the amount of donations and things like that. Do what you can to help that because I've lived 10 more years because of it. So you see those bumper stickers, you know, don't take your organs to heaven, you don't need them there, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, okay, any other questions? Mary, do you have any artificial kidney needs? I saw this thing. Not that I know of, just the dialysis process. They have a heart one that's artificial. They have artificial hearts. And it's like they carry a box around it. Yes. I am not aware of that. They may well be doing research and have, you know, common things like that. that I don't know about it. If you do, print it out and show it to me so I can share it in class. 